Rother. I'm head of the Environmental Health Division at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. You are all most welcome to our final discussion uh, in this lead and paint community practice. If you've just joined us, please do introduce yourself uh, in the chat room with your name, country, and organization. And just to remind you a little bit about this community of practice, if you are new to it, you're most welcome. Uh, that it is part of SICAM's knowledge management component of a Jeff funded project. And uh, as I mentioned, this is our fourth discussion uh, of the year. I'd also like to acknowledge the SICAM Secretariat members who are um, with us today, as well as the multi stakeholder consultation team members of this community of practice. Uh, if you would please continue introducing yourselves. I see many of you have already in the chat room with your name, country, and organization. We will be doing a lot of our discussion in the chat. You um, are welcome to, obviously, we're writing in English, but if you're struggling with English, you're welcome to write in French or Spanish, uh, and we have members that will assist with translation. So the aim of this uh, lead and paint community practice is really to foster a discussion and share experiences with different stakeholders. And we have different representatives today, which you can see from the introduction, to address key issues related to lead and paint globally. And it's really for an opportunity for us to identify key and emerging issues to contribute to the current uh, discussions and deliberations for the sound management of chemicals and waste beyond 2020. And we really do this as a peer-to-peer -peer learning exercise. It's not a webinar, uh, it's a chat, a really a discussion, and we encourage you to make sure you can find the chat function uh, introduce yourselves and become familiar with using that uh, space for where we will be discussing. If you are having technical issues, we do have a WhatsApp group. The link is on the screen and you're welcome to join there uh, and you'll be assisted with any technical problems. Uh, please do, I see many of you are joining now, please do continue to introduce yourselves with your name, country and organization in the chat. So I will um, shortly introduce the presenters. We will have three questions today, which we will have introduced by different presenters, and then we will spend about 20 minutes in the chat room discussing. We will also have some poll questions with Mentimeter, uh, and the link will be provided to you. Um, so please have your device ready in order to contribute to that. Uh, if you haven't signed up for the community of practice, the link will be posted shortly in the chat, and we encourage you to sign up uh, so that you do get information for the next discussions that we'll be having in 2022. So today we're going to be looking at uh, issues related around testing and labs to try and address the question, is there lead in my paint? And we are very honored to have four esteemed speakers who are going to be guiding us through this discussion. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. So our first speaker will be Mahela Claudia Pon, who has uh, joined the Knowledge and Risk Unit at uh, UNIP's Chemicals Branch uh, Economy Division in very recently, September 2021 where she's a program management officer. She primarily focuses on the provision of project and program management with um, on prevention, minimization, and environmentally sound management of uh, persistent organic pollutants. And she also works on lead paint related activities. Her career started more than 16 years ago in the Ministry of Environment uh, of Romania in the fields of chemicals and waste and industrial pollution control. Mihela, you're most welcome. Our next speaker will be Jael uh, Garino, who works as a global campaigner for uh, IPEN's Global Lead Paint Elimination Campaign, which focuses on ending the manufacture, import, export, sale, and use of lead-containing paints and similar surface coatings worldwide. 
IPEN is a global network of NGOs in over 125 countries working together for a world in which toxic chemicals are no longer produced or used in ways that harm human health and the environment. JL, you're most welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Our third presenter will be Tamar uh, Berman, who is a Chief Toxicologist in Environmental Health at the Ministry of Health in Israel. She's involved in policy decisions on environmental chemicals, including pesticides, chemicals in drinking water, and chemicals in consumer products. Tamar conducts research on children's exposure to environmental chemicals in paints, flooring materials, drinking water, and environmental tobacco smoke. You're most welcome, Tamar. Thanks for joining us. And our um, final speaker today will be Professor Adam Kiefer, who's um, a distinguished university professor of chemistry at Mercer University in the US. He has worked for over a decade in artisanal and small scale uh, gold mining communities, monitoring mercury. Doctor, you're most welcome. And uh, so you can see that we have quite an esteemed panel. I'm looking forward to today's discussion, and I hand the mic over to Mahela to take us through to the introduction. Mahela, you're most welcome to turn on your video if you like, and over to you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for the introduction, and I, I also want to welcome all the participants. I see we have a large number of participants today, so it, it's an honor for me to take part in this, um, in my first um, uh, community of practice meeting. Um, so basically, I will walk, walk you through um, uh, what we we'll, uh, introduce today into this meeting. So, um, lead paint tasting is a key element to the UNEP model law and the guidance for regulating lead paint. Uh, the, these two, two instruments uh, are assisting countries in establishing and implementing uh, regulation on lead paint. Um, the, the objectives of the paint testing could be various. Um, so, for example, uh, one purpose it, it could be for our awareness raising to inform consumers uh, on the lead content in paint and to inform advocacy to build momentum uh, in the country uh, towards the development adoption and implementation of legally, legally binding measures such as uh, laws regulation stars uh, decrees on lead paint but uh, also uh, lead paint testing um, um, supports the compliance checking um, in order, for example, to determine if the paints met, meet the uh, regulatory requirements for permitted lead content, but also um, um, to obtain uh, the required documentation for compliance with the lead paint limit, uh, for example, through third party laboratory testing uh, as to support the declaration of conformity, but also um, to check compliance with regulatory limits on lead paint and to monitor enforcement uh, if we are talking about um, government um, um, agencies uh, that are supposed to do this um, monitoring of compliance. Uh, not least, uh, lead paint testing um, uh, is done also for research purpose, purposes. Uh, to assess the health and environmental risk and consequences of exposure, uh, as to understand the prevalence of lead paint in a country, uh, to determine and inform the um, policy and decision making uh, makers uh, on the need uh, for risk mitigation measures. Uh, next slide, please. It is still the case that uh, many countries are lacking uh, data on the lead content of paints. 
and neither government official, officials nor the public is aware that paints with high level content are widely available uh, for sale on the national market. This can be either due to facing different challenges uh, in conducting lead paint testing. So for example, uh, difficulty in finding a competent laboratory or um, a third party that is accredited or in providing on getting training on, on sampling of paint or due to insufficient resources to conduct conduct desired uh, amount of sampling and testing or any other uh, logistical type of difficulties in shipping the samples uh, of paint to labs, especially outside the country. But also this can be due to the lack of testing. It is important to note that lack of in-country paint test data and laboratory capacity uh, is not an obstacle uh, for a country to develop and establish a lead paint law. For example, data from nearby countries is often available. Um, also, it is good to know that UNEP has developed a database of accredited laboratories undertaking uh, lead paint analysis globally uh, that provides information for the stakeholders who may not have direct access to a national laboratory. Um, Thus, it, it is important to know that lack of in-country laboratory capacity is not an obstacle in, in developing and establishing a lead paint law. Uh, worldwide, there are available testing methods that vary from portable devices like, uh, like uh, XRF uh, to laboratory analysis. Even there is <laughs> even limited testing of lead paint would make a big difference in developing uh, lead paint policy around the world, uh, thus supporting the characterization of lead paint problems and the importance of monitoring um, the implementation of new laws. New laws. Uh, therefore, uh, through this session of lead paint, lead in paint community of practice, we are trying, trying to learn how lead paint testing made a difference in managing um, uh, this product, lead paint, uh, around the globe. Um, regarding the paint samples, um, the budget available, but also the type of results that are sought, uh, like monitoring compliance with the law versus uh, assessing the lead levels in paint uh, that are found in the market, uh, these methods could be used uh, to test the lead in paint. The methods that uh, you uh, you, you are to be used uh, to test the lead in paint could vary. So um, the benefits and potential drawbacks uh, of lead analysis, uh, analyzing um, uh, are, are uh, varying from a portable uh, X-ray fluorescence analyzer and to uh, this inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy. Uh, and this will be briefly highlighted uh, throughout this session uh, today. Next slide, please. Therefore, we are inviting you to ask questions to the presenters, but also to each other about lead paint, paint testing, as well as to, to share your experience on how, how this um, uh, activity supported uh, lead paint management in your country region or at global scale. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mihela, for that introduction. Uh, I will now invite uh, JL to take us through the introduction to question one and then to get us into the discussion. If you're still just joining, please introduce yourself in the chat room with your name, organization, and country. Jail, over to you. Andrea, uh, next slide, please. Could we have the next slide, please? Sorry about that, it seems to be stuck. Okay. Hello to uh, nearly uh, 
40 participants uh, in today's discussion. In the next five minutes, I will be sharing with you how IPEN conducts its studies or researches on the lead content in paints. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge some of my colleagues from the IPEN network present today. Thank you for participating in today's discussion. Since there is very limited or no publicly available data on lead paint in many countries, IPEN's network of civil society organizations aim to analyze the lead content in paints that are commercially available on the market and generate national scientific information on lead content in paints that will, number one, help raise public awareness about lead paint and childhood lead exposure, two, aid in reaching out to paint manufacturers, especially SMEs or small and medium-sized uh, manufacturers to reformulate to non-lead paint production, and three, encourage the government in promulgating a regulation that will prohibit the manufacture, importation, and sale of lead paint. Due to limited resources, IPEN's strategy is to test paints that have high likelihood of containing lead. This is a targeted, purposive type of sampling. It prioritizes analyzing solvent-based paints, which highly likely to contain lead ingredients than water-based paints. Also, decorative architectural paints are prioritized for testing over industrial paints since the former are commonly used in residential homes and school environments, places children spend most of their time. In some instances, a number of anti-corrosive paints or primers and spray paints are also analyzed for lead content since these are commonly used to spruce up school projects, home furniture, appliances, gadgets, toys, and playground equipment. In terms of colors, bright colored paints, such as yellow, orange, red, and green, are prioritized for testing since these colors utilize lead pigments more than dull colored paints. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry about that. We seem to be having a technical problem. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Um, perhaps we could, uh, Eunice, could you maybe restart again? Um, we're not seeing the slides. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? We're still waiting for the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, just to continue, you know, in our paint studies, we carry out uh, paint market analysis, yeah. So thank you. Uh, and brand survey of paints no? sold in retail stores and online shops. Market analysis entails research on the national paint market using publicly available information accessible through, for example, web searches, online media, and public reports. And then paint brand survey, on the other hand, involves online research and visit, no? personal visit to stores selling paints to assess which brands sell paints we target for testing. So information gathered during the paint brand survey will be used to assess which paints will be purchased and analyzed for lead content. The purchase of paints is dependent on the types of paints with the potential for high lead content. For example, oil-based, alkyd or enamel paints, paints with bright colors, and others. Duplicate samples will be prepared for each paint. One set will be shipped to the lab for, anal for, analytic for analytical testing and another for safekeeping. 
the lab uses method EPA 3050B or 700B through acid digestion of samples, followed by flame atomic absorption spectroscopy as recognized by WHO as appropriate for total lead content analysis. Lab results will then be released within one to two weeks after receipt of samples. After this, we will write a report detailing the results of analysis and recommendations which we usually share with relevant stakeholders from the industry and government. Next slide, please. Thank you. In this slide, I will talk about some of the barriers and challenges that our IPEN colleagues have encountered in the conduct of testing lead in paint. So first, lack of resources to conduct sampling and testing. Uh, second, lack of information on how to conduct testing. Third, lack of laboratories accredited to conduct total lead content analysis in paint. Fourth, logistical difficulties in shipping samples of paints to labs outside the country, especially if there are no available labs that can test paint in the country. And lastly, storage and disposal of lead paints after testing. However, I'd like to point out that the lack of available national data on lead content in paints should not deter governments and industries to take immediate actions to eliminate lead paint. Regulators may use data from nearby countries or countries with similar economic standing as reference materials in the process of developing their own regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Jail. So if we could have the next slide, please. Uh, we will now move into question one. So why is paint testing being conducted in your country? And if it's not being uh, done, what are the barriers for this testing to take place? So make sure you can find the chat room. The, on the right-hand corner at the bottom is the chat icon, and we'll be in there for um, 20 minutes. Jail, you're welcome if you want to stay on and respond to some of the questions, uh, you're welcome to do so. I'll see you all in the chat. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jail, for taking us through question one and those important points. And Tamar, I hand over to you to take us through to question two. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So it's so exciting to be here with you today. Um, I'll wait for the, I can start talking while I wait for the, the slide. Um, so I'll be describing our experiences in Israel with using lead testing in paints and painted surfaces. And I really think of this as a story. Um, so before we started conducting our first rounds of testing in 2016, um, there were no legal restrictions on lead paint content in Israel. So we had a, a mandatory standard um, that required labeling of paints with lead content above uh, 1500 ppm. Um, spray paints were exempt from this labeling requirement. Um, I don't see the slides. Okay. So thank you, great. So that's before 2016. So we, we had a labeling requirement um, and spray paints were exempt from this requirement. So I was involved in meetings with stakeholders from the paint industry um, and during this time. And what I was told was that there's no potential exposure of the general public to lead in paints um, because lead is only used in industrial paints in Israel. So there was an understanding in, I think in industry and in different stakeholders that Israel doesn't really have a paint, a lead in paint problem because it's only used in very specific uses in it for an industry and there, therefore there wouldn't be exposure of the general public. So in 2017, um, we started testing painted surfaces in public areas like playgrounds and picnic benches. And we also tested spray paints, which are mostly imported. So I wanna point out that because of budget constraints, we really conducted limited testing. So we only tested 11 spray paints um, 25 locations in public playgrounds. And we also used portable XRF for this testing because we couldn't scrape or damage public property to obtain the paint samples. So this testing was done um, in public areas and we were very concerned obviously with damaging property. So we used um, portable XRF. So the benefit of portable XRF testing is that you can get a quick 
screening results without damaging the item that is being tested. So what you can see in the pictures are some of the um, items that we found that had very high levels of uh, lead. So these were um, playground areas. You can see one um, item with up to 29,000 ppm. And we also had high levels of lead in imported spray paints. You can see here, this paint had uh, 229 ppm. So with these results, we were able to go back to the paint industry and other stakeholders and we were able to characterize the, what we saw as the lead problem in Israel, which was use of industrial paints in public areas and also um, lead in imported spray paints. And there was consensus. So once we presented this data to the stakeholders, there was consensus that there was a need to change the standard on paints. So the new standard in paints in Israel is mandatory. Um, and it requires lead content in all paints below 90 ppm. So there are no exemptions, not for spray paints, not for industrial paints. All paints have to meet this legal requirement. Um, industry representatives asked for time to reformulate the industrial paints. And of course, we're given, um, I think there, there was a, um, a lot of discussion about how long they would need, um, but there was consensus that they would need time to reformulate the paints and they were given this time for phasing out lead in the paints. So between May 2019 and January 2021, both the old standard and the new standard were enforced, but beginning in 2021, only the new standard is enforced. So I use this slide to talk about using testing to characterize or understand our country's lead and paint problem. But in the next slide, I want to talk about using testing for compliance. So if you can go to the next slide. So it's easy to think that once you pass a new legislation or standard, then the work is done. Um, but we really learned that it's very important to remain vigilant and to follow up with testing to evaluate the impact of the new standard. So in early 2021, um, once the mandatory standard was already in force, we tested 22 spray paints on the market. And once again, we used XRF testing um, and we collected a small number of samples. So we really collected only 22 paints, but what we found was that seven out of these 22 spray paints had lead concentrations that were above the 90 ppm um, and there was maximum concentrations that were up to 8,000 ppm, meaning that our new standard alone was not effective in getting lead out of paint. And I think what we learned really is that um, we needed to do more outreach efforts. So I think originally we had done a lot of outreach efforts with manufacturers, but this, we realized that we need to do more outreach efforts with importers um, to raise awareness about the new standard and I hope this short description of our experience in Israel is a helpful example of the importance of testing, both for understanding whether the country has a lead and paint problem and also for ongoing compliance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tamar, for that introduction. We'll move on to the next slide uh, and for highlighting some very important points leading us into question two. So how has the lead testing made a difference in your country? And if you're not testing, how could it be helpful? So Tamar gave you some examples of Israel. Uh, it would be great to hear what you have to think in your country. So we'll go back into the chat room and discuss, and we will have some poll questions. And Tamar, you are more than welcome to stay on and respond to what you see in the sure, chat. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much, and thank you for guiding us through this uh, question, which is uh, really important to have more nuanced understanding about testing and how testing can be used. So thank you for that. We're now going to move on to um, question three, and I invite uh, Dr. Adam Kiefer to uh, take the floor. And uh, next slide, please, if we can go on to to questions for me. Adam, are you with us? I am, uh, and I'm ready to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for the introduction and this opportunity. Um, while we're waiting for the slides to get up, uh, the, the theme for today's discussion is, is there lead in my paint? But there's a natural follow-up there that many of you guys are, are asking, you know, interested in finding out, which is, 
how much lead is there and how do you know how much lead is there with all the information that that, that is available in terms of selecting an analytical technique um, how are you going to go through to decide uh, which technique is right for you um, and this leads to two big questions that you really need to answer first. And the first question is, what's the purpose of my analysis? And you heard uh, Tamara and, and JL both speak about using portable X-ray fluorescence analyzers to screen for uh, lead-based contamination and to do so highly effectively to change a national conversation in the case of Israel. Um, and similarly, Jail talked a little bit about lab-based spectroscopy, specifically ICPOES, um, for the quantification of how much lead is in paint. And so, realistically, that's the first question is, what's the purpose of your analysis? Are you screening and looking at a large number of samples, or are you quantifying? And, and really, this comes down to, are you analyzing new paint out of the can for compliance, or are you analyzing legacy paint for exposure? The, the the real thing here is that your needs are going to dictate the analytical technique that you choose. Next slide, please. So the first tool that we're going to talk about is, and perfect, is portable X-ray uh, fluorescence analyzers. They are an excellent screening tool. They are widely used. Um, they provide fast analysis, no sample prep. They're relatively inexpensive. And once you purchase a unit, the cost for running samples is effectively zero, um, especially if you're gonna be using them in the field for, for legacy paint, paint that's already on an object. Um, but they can be used in the lab as well. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the analyzer itself can be used to uh, uh, analyze tens of thousands, if not even more samples. and Typically, they require few consumables. One of the huge benefits is it doesn't require you to use conventional, what we call calibration or certified reference material. You're not going to need to necessarily develop your own calibration curve. It's all done for you. Um, and for that, there is a, a point and click component of this that, that is highly desirable. Um, but it's it's worth that we we talk a little bit more about this. These techniques, the PXRF can be used highly accurately, but it's going to require additional work. It's far more typically than just a point and click approach. Um, the other thing too is that this technique also oftentimes require uh, measures what we call lead loading, which is the amount of lead per per area as of as opposed to concentrations. Um, it takes a lot of, of work to ensure the accuracy of this technique. And so oftentimes we utilize it um, for estimation and screening as opposed to quantification. Um, and you can see the work that we've done with the Guyanese government in, in, in Guyana using this technology for screening. Next slide, please. So the, 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 as opposed to PXRF, um, what, what if you need to monitor lead concentrations uh, specifically for accuracy? Um, what if you need to ensure that the readings that you have are accurate? Um, specifically, what if you need to ensure that a manufacturer uh, is complying with the law? Next slide, please. In that case, uh, Oftentimes, you'll see people use lab-based technologies such as ICPOES, inductively coupled plasma and optical emission spectroscopy, and that's a lot of words. Um, but GFAAS, uh, graphite furnace atomic absorption spectrometers, are also used. These are highly accurate, um, and they're lab-based. You're not going to ever pick these up, put them in a backpack, and, and walk around. They're very heavy, they're very expensive, and they require a full lab for use. But one of the reasons that they're highly accurate is because they require a full laboratory. The operator is gonna develop a calibration curve. You're going to be able to use what are called certified reference materials, uh, standards that have a known concentration of lead in them. And you're gonna be able to apply what we call an acid digestion, and you've heard this term before, which gets rid of the solid components of a, the paint and basically dissolves the lead um, and allows you to analyze them uh, without any matrix or substrate 
concerns, basically getting some of the things that might affect the accuracy of your analysis out of the way. The downside is this requires trained personnel um, and, and a decent budget, as we've heard before. There's a reason that this method or these methods are the standard for quantification for lead and paint. Um, they're highly accurate uh, and we use them for quantification. Uh, next slide, please. And so the next slide is, is really a, a little bit of our work in Guyana that we've done with the Guyana, uh, Guyana Geology and uh, Mines Commission. We utilized PXRF as a tool for screening and it was fantastic, but we found that we needed to, to take care when interpreting the results. The PXRF was used for screening to tell us where to uh, collect samples um, specifically for further analysis for, for ICPOES. Our results showed that paint in Guyana ranged from no lead whatsoever to 250,000 parts per million is quantified by the ICP. The good news for us is that anytime the PXRF determined that there was lead in paint, the ICP backed that up. And so the, the XRF was very useful in this. One of the things that we found, though, was oftentimes the PXRF actually underestimated the amount of lead in the paint. Um, and to that end, we were thankful to have the ICP to help us quantify that. So today we use the PXRF for screening and the ICPOES for quantification and compliance. Next slide, please. But for tomorrow, our future work is going to be to determine how to compare what we're seeing in the field to the ICP. We wanna go ahead and make sure that if there is a way for us to compare ICP and XRF to have all the benefits of the field portable PXRF and the cost, um, but be able to compare them to the, the, the robust, highly accurate ICP, we can do that. And we're finding that we have a current method that allows us to have very good correlation between the two. And so perhaps tomorrow we'll be able to correlate what we're seeing in the field with the PXRF to the more expensive um, less typically available ICP for both quantification and compliance. Next slide, please. And so in terms of getting the discussion started, uh, we're interested to know what methods you've used to determine concentrations of lead and paint. And if you've not tested, what type of methods would you consider using? Now there's more methods than, than what we have uh, talked about here so we're really interested in getting that feedback to kind of to kind of go through and and start this i i know that it, a lot of this will happen in the chat but i already see a, a question to start off um for testing new paint with portable xrf is it possible to paint a surface first let it dry and then test with portable xrf it absolutely is angela um and that is the some of the work that we've started doing in in guyana um we we followed a method uh, that we first saw done by Perry Gottesfeld in Cameroon, where we painted glass louvers and we scraped the, the new paint off and then analyzed them in the field. What we found is we got much, much more accurate results um, by, by doing this as opposed to, but we had to scrape it off and then homogenize it first to make sure it's uniform. Um, and that's where we get that good correlation. And so I, I guess at this point, we, we might go through and, and start kicking it over to the, the chat itself. Yes, indeed. So everyone is invited to go to the chat. And thanks very much, uh, Adam, for uh, now really going into the technical details of how one can do testing and that it is applicable in countries like uh, Guyana or South Africa, um, which is good to hear.
Adam, if you find you're getting too many questions and you can't type quick enough, you are welcome to speak to that. Yeah, I'm not known for my, my typing skills. Um, so a couple things to point out. Uh, Tamar, you ask a great question. If a country can only do screening and not quantification with lab methods, absolutely. Um, I would actually encourage under most conditions that everybody starts off with PXRF. PXRF provides you with the opportunity to one, identify that there is a problem um, and to do so rapidly and inexpensively. Once you're able to identify the problem, then you can get into to more of the, the conventional testing. I shouldn't say conventional testing. You can get into more of the laboratory-based testing with ICP. Identifying that there is a problem is remarkably important in beginning the conversations like we're having today. Uh, in Malaysia, we use PXRF to test scrape paint and spray paint, also sent samples to the US for testing in lab. Many times when using PXRF technology, it's used as a screening tool. Um, and for environmental samples, for example, 10% of the samples might be sent off for confirmation to, to an existing lab. Um, and, and, and to, to a, you know, to confirm those results. Are there published standard screening methods for PXRF? Um, there, there are, um, there, there, I believe there's an EPA method. Um, but but oftentimes um, it depends on what matrix you're looking at, where, where the, the paint is. Um, and so if you're interested in this, one of the, the, the most effective uh, resources is actually uh, US HUD testing. Um, and there's a number of private companies out there that also do training specifically for this. Um, but but um, that, that screening is available. Yep, and, and thank you, Angela, for, for EDXRF, it's ASTM that does it. Just to note that there is a poll up, the Menti link is in the chat, and this time you can choose more than one answer. So please do uh, find your way to Menti and let us know who conducts the lead paint analysis for your country. And if the, if you want to comment about this question, you can do that in the chat. Thank you. Earlier in the chat, by the way, the, the, the WHO document that, um, that is used to outline uh, the different uh, techniques for analysis is very useful. Um, for those of you doing compliance, I, I strongly in, in, encourage you to take a look at um, the limitations for some of the methods, specifically in terms of measuring for concentrations, to make sure that they match the samples that you're using. Ah. So beside PXRF, so this is a question from Mohammed. Um, beside PXRF, can you use any other type of XRF? And the answer to that question is yes. The benefit of PXRF is that it's field portable. There are laboratory uh, XRF techniques as well, and there, there's standards for, for using these in the lab. Um, those are typically are, uh, can be significantly more expensive for analysis. Um, and they, they require more knowledge on how to operate them. Um, but yes, you can absolutely do that. For this talk, we, we, we uh, highlighted PXRF um, simply because it, it's so common for use in the field. So, Adam, there is a question from Chuck, but before you respond to that, maybe you want to make some comments on the response to the poll, and then we'll move on to the next poll. Sure thing. One of the things that I think is, is interesting to me, who conducts the lead paint analysis for your country, um, governments and standards institutions, um, it, it's not surprising that those are, 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 are two large components. 
um, similarly with, with commercial labs. Um, I'm always surprised that academic institutions uh, do not necessarily or don't play a, a larger role in this. We oftentimes have the instrumentation, but I think as, as Tamar has, has pointed out, a lot of times, um, a lot of times what we run into here uh, is um, a lack of funds to do that. Um, with regards to Chuck's question, I, I've not considered that. Um, I, I'm not sure what sensors they're using at this point or whether or not they would work under these conditions. Um, yes, and, and Ken, I, I totally agree that Flame AA uh, may be good enough um, with the lower detection limit of 40 ppm. Um, I, I know that GFAAS is being phased out um, because it's not as widely used in commercial testing labs as well. Um, but conventional flame AA is significantly less expensive. It would still require uh, sample digestion and the like. So we have our last poll for today on the screen. If testing exists, what were the lead levels you have seen in new paint? or paint on existing surfaces. And you can, again, choose several choices. So you can go to the Menti link in uh, the chat and give us your response. Thank you. So there is a question from Andrew. I don't know if you can see that. Yes, I can. And Andrew, that might actually be a question for Ken. Uh, Ken, I believe you actually work with or for ASTM, if I remember correctly. Um, and so you might have a better answer to that question than I do. I'm used to the flame AA methods only going to 100 ppm. So what we're seeing in this poll um, is that realistically it, it, it is going to to run the gamut from levels that are below 90 ppm, which is kind of that that standard that that, that we employ or or desire to employ. Um, and then above 600 ppm, uh, we've commented on the fact that in Guyana, and I believe JL commented that um, their experiences they found paint. Um, with concentrations exceeding 250,000 ppm. Um, and so the ability to go ahead and either screen those with PXRF or have the ability to dilute those down for analysis um, prior to analysis with laboratory techniques is, is important.
I'd like to follow up really quickly on uh, Angela's question to Ken, because I don't know the answer to this. Uh, is there a method at this point for flame AA that, that can be employed to get detection limits or I'm sorry, uh, limits of quantification, I guess, below uh, 100 ppm for flame AA in countries outside of the US? Tamar, uh, again, uh, great question. Academic institutions may be less interested in what's perceived as an old problem, not cutting edge. One of the things that I would say um, is continuing to identify that lead in paint is still a problem. Um, con continuing to, to recognize that many of the common analytical techniques that academic uh, entities have can be employed to combat this problem. Um, and I, I think one of the things that, that, that we do at Mercer that, that is pretty effective is acknowledging that science can be employed as service um, is a way to take an old problem and make it cutting edge to be able to utilize students to, or to be able to uh, have students appreciate that they're brick and mortar classroom knowledge can be applied to a real world problem to help people um, might be a good way to convince them that this old problem um, still requires people to, to further understand uh, and explore um, options for it. Adam, would you like to make any concluding points as well as responding to Angela's question? So, with regards to Angela's question, um, and and part of the thing that that happens here is that there's EDXRF is is really kind of the standard now for portable XRF. There are many different applications of of XRF technology. There there's total reflection XRF, which uses um, a much steeper angle um, and a much thinner film. Um, I, I think it would be beyond the scope of this conversation and the time that we have allotted to really go through the difference between those two. Um, I, I would encourage people to take a look at the WHO document um, that was posted earlier in the chat, um, which does a good job of explaining the difference between laboratory based uh, XRF techniques and portable XRF techniques, and that's a good place to start. Um, for those of you that have specific questions on it, uh, I'm you can Google me, um, and I'd be more than willing to respond to any emails that I receive with specific questions about that. Um, and Andrea, I think you asked me to do something else, but I I lost it in the response there. Just really to if you had any some summing up points that you wanted to make before we conclude today's session. I, I think that that uh, the, the key thing here is, is that lead paint is still an issue. I don't 
think that based on the, the number of people that are here dealing with this, I think that it's not only uh, an issue that is global, um, but one of the things we've not been talking about is how it affects human health. Um, and there's a natural extension that we're talking about between screening and, and quantification via compliance. To be able to go through, we still need to do work to determine the toll that, that lead and paint uh, makes on human health. Um, and, and continuing on with these conversations, I think, is going to be very important to the future.